Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Gorge Views, and this is Hockey Niagara Part 3, where we're featuring the Cooper's Hawk in Niagara Falls. We're also going to talk about expanding our bird wealth here in Niagara Falls and Niagara County, and I'm going to give you an intro to Dr. Lane Ingram and the Soil Food Web, which is kind of a continuation on what I presented in the last episode about uh, Gabe Brown and what he's managed to accomplish on his own ranch in North Dakota. I think as I introduce Dr. Lane Ingram to you guys, you start to see some of the science that explains the results that Gabe has been able to achieve on his own ranch. So jumping into the Cooper's Hawk, what you can see is uh, quite a few more observations in eBird compared to the Sharpshin, which only had just slightly under 900,000. And the Cooper's Hawk, over 2 million. Why is that? Is it a larger population? I'm not really sure. I haven't dug into the two hawk species enough to see what the actual estimates are of the populations. It does appear the Cooper's Hawk's a little bit more comfortable around urban and suburban environments whereas the sharpshins are quite a bit shyer so that may also explain the higher observations because again wherever you have birds and humans you're going to get more human observation of the bird um, 86,000 photos though quite a few more I mean considering we got almost twice the number of um, observations and about three times the number of photos. Pretty significant number of photos. What I would say is um, Cooper's Hawk, more likely to be in a suburban environment, so therefore more likely to perch. To give you an example, no sooner did I finish the Sharp Shin Hawk video and get it uploaded, as I was uh, going to get some food over on 3rd Street, Right down the center of 3rd Street, about four feet off the ground, this hawk comes flying by. At the initial second, I was sure it had to be a red tail. Um, and then it pulled up and perched right on the top of uh, the old ice house, right on the corner of 3rd and Main. There it is. Certainly not a red tail. And according to my uh, Picture Bird identification app, it is a Cooper's hawk. And one of the ways we can feel pretty certain that the um, bird identification app is correct is this white terminal band you see down at the... So if you look all the way down to the bottom of his tail, the tail looks very square, number one. Two, he is a pretty decent sized hawk. And then that terminal white band on his tail. Those are... You know, that's a significant... The fact that it's square and the fact that it's a white terminal band are, are pretty good identifiers that it's a Cooper Hawk, Cooper's Hawk compared to the Sharpshend. So, sorry this was taken with the cell phone. It's all I had at the time, so not the best photo. Now, here's some photos taken earlier this fall. And the computer also identified this as a Cooper's, but, you know, I'm not convinced yet. One... The tail's really not quite that square, although the center tail feathers are definitely the longest on this one. Um, and that's what we're seeing. You know, the head to me seems smaller, so I'm inclined to think it's actually a sharp shin, even though the computer identified it as Cooper's Hawk. And this is one of the challenges of birding, folks. These two species, yesterday's and today's, are, are a bird that many, many people often misidentify. Now, some of the other resources we have to help us. All right, so now I'm in all about birds, and that could be a little bit more. But then there's a um, Project Feeder Watch. In a Project Feeder Watch, it goes into more of the field markets and compares these two side by side. And you can see by the uh, tail tip coloring, the sharp shin has a very narrow white tip. And 
and the Coopers has typically a very clear white tip. The other thing is the tail ship, tail tip shape. Um, the outer tail feathers are usually the longest, or nearly so. So maybe that's why the computer, I guess in that other bird that I showed you that the computer identified as a Cooper's hawk, that's right, its center tail feathers are the longest. It's when it's perched, it looks square, but when it's in flight, it would probably look a little bit more rounded. Um, whereas the sharp shin would look more like a V from what I'm reading. But I'm a novice birder. I'm a rookie birder. I'm learning as I go. And that's part of the fun, folks. Part of the fun. But let's jump over back into eBird and look at the sharp shin from a New York State perspective. Oh, I'm sorry, I explored by region. It's not what I wanted. Well, Jesus. Looks like someone just identified a Cooper's Hawk just yesterday, though. Um, so let's see what its statistics are at the New York State level. 88,000 observations with 4,000 photos. And as you can see on the weekly bar chart in New York State, it is a year-round bird. If you look at the... Uh, observation density chart. You'll see that we see it quite often here in Western New York, in Niagara Falls, Niagara County area. Now, I'm a New York State birder, so my stats will show up here. If I were to show you like Erie County, though, where I haven't done a bird yet, you wouldn't see any of my data. I wouldn't have this band up in eBird. So another thing you should know about eBird, if I looked at the United States, I would get a little thing up here too. But anytime you look at a geographic area that you have not birded in, your data is not going to show up. What I'd like to do is go back and see at the New York State level, recent media. And this is what I was talking about uh, the last couple episodes where I talked about going into the Niagara County bird data and rating the photos that are there. Because if you do that, then they're going to end up here. Like I said, if you're looking at New York State as a whole and wondering where... I'm going to be visiting the U.S., I'm going into New York State, and I want to do some birding. Where do I want to go birding in New York State? Oh, well, if you start seeing incredible photos and you dig into it and find out, well, they're all in Niagara Falls versus Suffolk County, then you might be inclined to come to Niagara Falls. And that would certainly help our economy out. Now, look at the top birders in New York State. We've got from 462 to 429. And that's the top 10 in life birders here in New York State. And there's only a difference of less than 40 species between number one and number 10. And that's something else I want you guys to kind of keep in mind. Now, in New York State, we have 51,000 birders that have started an eBird account. Um, now me only birding a year, I'm in close to the top 10% here at 5,200th um, with only 102 species to date. More important, so, and I'm just showing you that how quickly you can move up the ranks right now. Um, particularly in Niagara County, I think I was 35th for Niagara County last year because we just don't have enough birders. It's not a lot of competition. And that's what I'm gonna show you when I show you Niagara County and I show you the top birders. The spread is dramatically different between the first and the 10th person. And you know, it's just like high school sports. Bigger schools have a lot more top athletes and those top athletes practicing and competing against each other tends to drive their skills higher. Very similar with, with birders, you know, the other birders, that sense of competition just pushes you further because you're living in the same county and so therefore going to the same hot spots, which I'm going to get to in a second. You're going to see what the other person's doing, you notice them, it's going to motivate you to get out there more. So the more birders we have, the more we'll probably be motivating each other to get out there more. Now, you know, here's the top 10 counties in New York State, and I brought this up in earlier episodes. 
how Niagara is number 12 as far as total number of species. But again, look at total number of checklists. That's you know, basically how many times a human has gone in and put in, a, I've seen these birds in Niagara County. So we're 12th there, but we're only like 35th the number of checklists. To me, that's a huge indication of bird wealth. When you don't have that many people observing, yet you're ranking 12th, you know, I mean, look at how many counties beneath us have way more checklists submitted. Now, another interesting fact, look at Tompkins County. It's number nine, but it has the largest number of checklists in the state. And I'm gonna tell you, if you don't know the population of Tompkins County, it is not the most populated county in New York State. Now, Suffolk, Nassau, Queens, Kings, Monroe. So Monroe is Rochester, very highly, you know, a large city and a decent population. Richmond, Westchester, Oswego, not so much. But Tompkins is where Cornell is, right? All these different bird tools like eBird, run by Cornell, Lab of Ornithology, all about birds, and Project Feeder Watch that we just kind of looked at to get more sharp shin versus Cooper's Hawk tips, um, also run by Cornell. So basically what we can expect is out of all of the United States, Tompkins County has the highest concentration of ornithologists and has a lot more bird observation activity occurring. So I don't think they're missing any birds there. I talked about in earlier episodes this concept of bird wealth, which isn't just the variety of species you have in your area. It's also the ease with which you can observe them. So another reason why I see Niagara County as having an abundant bird wealth, one, I think, you know, Erie County has 341, we have 329 species observed, but given the number of observers we have compared to Erie County, it would be easy for us to miss one of our birds. Now, the other thing I would point out is that you know, so many fewer checklists and yet we're still pretty close. Erie County does have Lakeshore, but not a lot of it. Um, now it has Lakeshore right by Buffalo, which is a high population. And it has, and, and the start of the Niagara River there too, and that's two ecotones that are coming together, you, particularly in the winter with all the different duck species, wintering over along the Niagara River. That's a lot of great area with great sight lines where they're gonna observe birds. But if you really look at the border of Erie County, that's about the only zone where they have those great sight lines. Now let's jump over to Niagara County. Well, the upper river is our entire southern border of the county. The Niagara River is also our entire western border of the county. And our entire northern border is Lake Ontario. So you can see three of the four borders of our rather square county are bordered by water, allowing you to see quite a bit of distance. You know, and then the Niagara Gorge allows you to see multiple elevations at the same time. Um, to me, if you really want to do a quality birding of the Niagara Gorge, you need a team of three. All right, walking together with one always keeping their eyes down below, one scanning, you know, basically cliff top level and one scanning high. Because I don't know how many times it's happened to me. I kind of get focused on birds at a certain elevation and then... Uh, you know, catch something on the core of my eye and don't quite get the photo, but get to see a hawk or something else. Because um, it's a lot of sky to be looking at. And it's, it's kind of similar to lake. You kind of need two people, someone looking in close, someone kind of looking way out there. And even then, you can miss some stuff close in that's really high. So when you have that good of sight lines, the only thing really inhibiting you is... Um, whether or not you're keeping your head on a swivel. Now, I said I would talk about expanding bird wealth. One of the ways I think Niagara County has a chance to expand its bird wealth is getting more people to 
go look for those species that haven't been observed in Niagara County, but have been observed in Erie County. And frankly, we can look at, um, you know, any, any one of our neighboring counties like uh, Orleans or Genesee County, see if there's any birds been observed in those counties that we haven't observed. Study the habitat a little bit and then really spend some quality time in the habitat we have available for that particular bird species that hasn't been observed here. And we might very well find we do have that bird here. And that would add to our number. This is being seen, particularly in Colombia. You know, South America does have a wide variety of species. And there's various birds that are considered endemic to certain countries, meaning, you know, only exist there. Um, and Colombia keeps stealing its neighboring countries' endemic birds because their birding is taking off. Their ecotourism focused on their bird wealth is really taking off. You know, with that increased human observation, they're discovering they have birds they didn't know they had. And there's a chance Niagara County could be suffering the same thing. So that's one way to expand a bird wealth. The other thing is, as I've been talking about over here on the right, promoting our bird wealth so people are more aware of it and get to see the beauty of Niagara County and how easy it is to take a great photo of an interesting bird here. The other way is hotspots. So you can see Niagara or New York State has 7,738 hotspots. Let's look at Suffolk County. Suffolk County has 658 hotspots, a rather urban county with 658 hotspots. Keep that in mind. Now let's look at Niagara County. Only 90 hotspots, not 600. Now let's look at Erie County, our closest neighbor. 186 hotspots. Right? Do you think there's that many more great bird spots in Erie County than there are in Niagara County? I, I, I don't think so. You know, double the number? No, it's got quadruple the population and only double the number of hotspots. And basically a hotspot is you can nominate any place you want to as a hotspot, but until enough people have made enough observations of birds, you know, they don't declare it a hotspot in eBird. So you earn that status as a hotspot. And so it takes human effort to make a specific location a bird hotspot. So it has a lot less to do with the birds and a lot more to do with humans. If we had more birders, or if the birders we had started, um, you know, collectively focus their efforts in some of the other areas because there's different people who go to different places like the entire Niagara Gorge. There is no hot spot. Niagara Falls State Park's a hot spot and Whirlpool State Park is a hot spot. But between the two, there's no hot spot. Yet, I managed to take a photograph of over 100 species right here in front of my building and any given day I can take a picture of 20. I can always stand on my porch, you know and get amazing birds. Got the bald eagle from my porch, but it's not a hot spot. And when I look at, um, well, let's just look, you know, a lot of people do Three Sisters, particularly this time of year, Three Sisters is a great place to go um, because of all the different ducks. But Goat Island, you know, someone was on the Lockport Nature Trail today. And you'll see that up in the North Towns too, a lot of, um, you know, people basically backyard birding. But those don't become hot spots. And that purple sand pumper from yesterday. So if we were to increase our hot spots, we would probably, you know, from a, is it worth my time to go visit that geographic area standpoint, more hot spots makes a geographic area more attractive. So if Niagara County had more hot spots, we'd be more attracted to birds. Another way to expand our bird wealth. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to point out, is we have a lot more potential than meets the eye, but it's gonna take 
effort on our part to develop that. How do we do that? It's going to take more than me talking to a screen and hoping someone watches it. Birdie Niagara is an event that happens, or Birds on Niagara is an event that happens every February. So in just a couple weeks here, they're going to be hosting an event. It's really an Erie Niagara um, event. And, you know, I'll, some, I'll put a link in the description of this video. Um, hopefully I'll remember. If not, someone please comment and I'll put the link into their website. Last year they did it virtual. And uh, lots of different videos and wealth of knowledge was presented in those videos. And I think it's worth everyone's time to watch those. Just to understand, what, I mean, it focused more on the conservation efforts and more about what it took to make us a Ramsar site and what it took to make us um, an Audubon designated globally significant important bird area. Um, you also talk about, in fact, this is an international bird festival generally under COVID conditions. Well, we know how that goes. But normally it's the whole Niagara River, both countries kind of collaboratively doing bird activity for several days. Um, and that's a pretty fascinating thing. But another way we kind of change our culture here locally isn't just getting more Niagara County people, more Niagara Falls specifically people in participating in that event. But we should probably host some of our own events, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, why should it only be once a year? We have birds here 12 months of the year. But isn't it interesting that they choose February to do this big event? Why February? Because February is kind of when birds are at their peak here in this area. Because we have all these birds wintering in our area, so many different duck species, so many different gull species. And, you know, a huge proportion of our birds remain here all year long. We don't, you know, the wobblers come in and go out and migrate through, but they don't stay here in the winter. But the Blue Jays, they're here all winter long. The Cardinal, all winter long. Chickadee, all winter long. Um, House Sparrow's definitely here all winter long. Um, just, I saw some starlings yesterday. I didn't think they were here all winter long. I've seen robins in the winter. All the different woodpeckers, they're here in the winter. So March, April, May, when we don't really have that many tourists, um, September, October, November, December, those months when we don't have that many tourists, we should be hosting other bird events. And as we continue talking about developing our local economy, and quite frankly doing that by saving the world, using birding as an entry point, I'm going to talk about a lot of other events that we could tie together with birding events to really expand the market, expand the attractiveness of making the journey here to do birding when we're hosting birding events because we're also tying other things, other activities to that birding event. So it's just not about birding. So I'm not gonna bring my whole family along and parts of the family aren't interested in birding, but they might be interested in these other activities that we would host at the same time. Expanding our bird well. Keep that in mind. Think it over. Another way we might expand our bird wealth or change our culture is with our schools. You know, now, I went to elementary school here in Niagara Falls, but I moved out to Barker and did high school in Barker. And I don't, so I don't know about the high school homecoming rituals in Niagara Falls. Out to Barker, though, each class had a color, right? And so you had color pride day. When you wear your class's color, there's a lot of different competitions um, between each class. But what if you had a class bird instead of a class color? And you celebrated that bird instead of a color. So I don't know if Niagara Falls does anything like that for homecoming. You know, like we had a float competition, we had a parade in Barker. I don't know if we do that here. Um, but whatever we do, maybe we want to integrate birds into that. What if kids in elementary school, you know, each year did some type of project. First learning about different birds, then like choosing what their class bird's going to be. Then on Arbor Day, doing some type of habitat project that, 
you know, it was designed to attract that specific bird. And then over the course of the rest of their school years, they're watching that habitat to see if that particular species actually does go and occupy the habitat. Um, just an idea. Just one of thousands of ideas. And that's why I want this to be a community discussion, folks. The more people get involved in the discussion, the more thoughts we'll have. And whatever ideas we decide to implement as a community will probably be implemented better because more minds thought about some of the risks, some of the ethics, uh, where to get more resources to bring into the activity, to get it to step off on the right foot or progress faster, sooner. Now I want to kind of shift directions and talk about soil health. In case some of you haven't made the connection yet, why I keep talking about soil health and birds in the same videos? These things come together, right? Without soil health, you don't have life. Without soil health, you don't have insects. Without insects, you don't have bird food for a, a lot of the different species. So you need soil health. Without soil health, the species that aren't insect focused in their diet, well, what do they eat? Well, they eat seeds and they eat berries and they eat nuts. Well, without soil health, you don't have those things either. All right, so you need soil health to promote your bird wealth, to grow your bird wealth, to secure your bird wealth, and to secure our own health, folks. So, jumping into soil. So, where I actually want to start is on this video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play a little bit and then kind of stop it and talk about it a little bit. As global temperatures rise and erratic weather continues across the planet, people around the world are searching for a solution to climate change. One solution to this crisis may be found in the ground beneath our feet. Scientists, researchers, and land stewards are now studying soil and the carbon cycle as a biological solution to climate change. Through photosynthesis, plants absorb carbon from the atmosphere. The process of converting atmospheric carbon dioxide into soil carbon is called the carbon cycle. Pause here for a second, folks, and um, if you haven't delved much into the carbon cycle and carbon processes, then you're probably not aware of the Basically, we have two major sinks, and what we mean by sinks and carbon sequestration is where you can store carbon. On the right side of your screen, uh, but the ocean side, right? The oceans are one sink and the soils are another sink, another area to store carbon. Now, the soil side tends to store carbon a lot, lot longer, whereas the ocean side is a little bit more dynamic basically as you, you know, that sink it's more of a high to low density flow right the higher we the higher we raise co2 in the atmosphere the more the ocean's going to absorb which sounds great right oh well, why, why should we worry about it if we get too high the oceans will start absorbing more and they will um, it also releases it faster, and there's some other variables involved on whether or not it will hold it for a long time despite the saturation in the sky. And if you were to equal out the saturation, you know, then of course it's not going to absorb it any faster. But the other thing you have to understand is CO2 in the oceans tends to convert to carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, well, that's not good for the lower life forms in the ocean. Um, tends to soften the shells of the shellfish. Um, and, and there's a whole lot of other rippling effects to carbonic acid in the oceans. So it's a horrible place to be storing excess CO2. You know, that's, we, sh we should not be pushing the world's oceans to store all the extra CO2. We should be pushing the soils. 
because what you'll find on the soil side is on the soil side it's way healthier for all of us it's way healthier for the life in the soil which is essential and as we continue learning what's been learned over the last few decades you'll see it is incredibly important for the life in the soil that life in the soil also changes the soil that you know, the structures that the microbial life in the soil make make the soil more porous allowing it to infiltrate water quicker as you remember from yesterday Gabe talking about his experience you know when he first started ranching in 93 he could barely infiltrate an uh, inch of water um, and he pointed you know he had a photo of a farm field the, that was taken, you know, not too far from wherever he gave his talk that showed all that standing water and showed that that soil wasn't infiltrated in the water, even though it was a very low amount, like half an inch or an inch or something like that. Um, and that's what causes runoff when your soil can't infiltrate the water. And with that runoff goes erosion. And with that erosion, that runoff, there goes your nutrients. And if you're using any type of inputs like herbicides, fungicides, and... Uh, pesticides that's getting washed away in downstream and again contributing to our ocean problems but you reverse that start putting carbon in the soil you start getting more nutrient rich foods you start supporting the natural wildlife that we have and everything works better right so the soil side the soil sink is the sink you want to put your CO2 in. The carbon cycle uses sunlight, plants, soil, and microorganisms to turn CO2, a climate change causing gas, into soil organic matter. But the soil that can help us solve the climate crisis is disappearing. Soil is a super organism. It's a whole constellation of life down there. Soil is both the receiver of the detritus of life and the, and, and the yielder up of the, the, the source of life. Soil is, is kind of one of the unsung heroes, um, possibly our saving grace when it comes to climate change because it is one of those things that um, it's not a new technology. It doesn't require massive uh, investment in, in new systems. It literally is pay attention to what's there and try to rehabilitate what we've lost. It's, it's a solution right under our feet. We don't really have to do too much except not destroy it. The idea is the amount of carbon that's associated with fossil fuels is just taking that system out of equilibrium. Take it out of equilibrium and it's going to accumulate. In the atmosphere, excess carbon contributes to climate change. Carbon levels in the atmosphere are now at 392 parts per million. Most climate scientists agree that atmospheric CO2 levels must decrease to 350 parts per million for our continued survival. I want to point something out. This video was done in 2013 or 14. I think they gave you the 2013 data. I forget what, when this was published. I can tell you real quick. Um, this was put out in 2014 using 2013 data. If we go and look now, we're up to 450 parts per million so despite this video despite a lot of other videos um, we definitely haven't reversed the trend yet we're not moving that fast and there's no indication we're going to move any faster over the next seven to eight years than we have over the past seven to eight years which means we're likely to start increasing even though there's more and more frantic angst out of different corners of humanity about this, right? Um, you know, some people call them climate alarmists. Well, if we don't start making some progress, those alarmists are going to be right. And then the pressure will be on to use draconian measures on the human population, kind of like we saw with COVID, where the government is just forcing us to behave in ways that we find uh, tyrannical, probably. I mean, just you know, think about it. If you gotta get locked in your house because of a virus, well, if the world's truly going to end, 
and cause mass extinction on the planet, where are we going to get locked up then by our governments? Right? Do we want to live in that kind of a world? Right? And I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm just pointing out that the more ammunition the alarmists have to sound the alarm, the more potential there is for dramatic change in social structures. I personally don't want to see that. Right? I'm more worried about that right now, quite frankly, than I am worried about climate change. I'm concerned about climate change. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm concerned about a lot of other things that are already happening right now that should alarm us. All right? Food cost, food nutrient density, um, the health disorders and dietary issues so many people are having that's causing our society to spend so much more money on health care. Um, those things worry me. The loss of biodiversity, particularly when we... The more you study this stuff and the more you go down the rabbit hole that I've been going down, the more you realize we've barely scratched the surface on understanding life on our own planet. Right? When we talk about this microbial life that's essential to the soils, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of different species of all the different classes of microbes. And we like come to identify like a few percent of those. And when you understand that so many of our medicines have been found at that strata of life, is a cure for cancer out there? We don't know. We don't know. Unfortunately, we've produced way too many chemists and physicists and engineers in the last decade. Maybe not too many, but way more of those than we've produced biologists. And the biologists that we produce, they focus more on human biological questions and less on microbial biological questions and plant biological questions. And it is nowhere near as simple as we thought. And that's what I hope to help all of you realize over the course of this series this year is just how much we've learned in the last couple of decades that has not entered the mainstream yet, right? This video from seven years ago, when you watch this video and then you skip ahead eight years to more recent stuff, in this video, everything was tentative, you know, maybe the ground's a good place to put carbon. Maybe it can do this. Maybe we can change it. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's definite now. There's no question about it. Not only has additional research continued to verify, prove, and expand upon all the reasons why it will work, how it works, um, but so many people have put that science into practice and demonstrated concretely it works and solve so many other problems at the exact same time. So never mind the climate change question, you're solving a lot of other problems today by going down this path. And the one guy said it doesn't take a lot of investment. It doesn't take any investment, right? It actually is cost saving to focus on the soils. I cannot emphasize this enough. I really cannot. As soon as you start killing the organisms with these inorganic fertilizers, with these salts, with these toxic chemicals, you just go downhill faster. You destroy more and more of the biology, more and more quickly, until you're really in a system that you have no choice but to use those inorganic fertilizers. You have to, and you start to see effects on water quality because all of those inorganic fertilizers are highly leachable. Oh, we start seeing rivers and lakes and streams having horrible problems and we have no good water to drink. Or it starts costing an incredible amount of money to buy the drinking water that tastes okay. So it's having far-reaching consequences. In our whole society, human health is definitely very much involved. Well, animal health is involved. If the plants that you're eating don't contain the nutrients to keep your animals healthy, to keep you healthy, our health is suffering. Yeah, so there, that was Dr. Lane Ingram um, about eight years ago. As by that time, this woman had already made a ton of scientific discoveries. 
Um, she's one of, I don't know, a couple dozen scientists around the planet who doing great research in the same area, making discoveries almost on a daily basis, right? I mean, she does a nice job there of not sounding like a techie scientist, but really kind of in plain language talking about the ramifications of continuing to manage the land the way we've been managing it. Among many other things, she started a, the Soil Food Web. It's like a company that one, you can take a bunch of classes and at the end you get your certification as a soil consultant. Um, and they put a lot of products just to help the general public understand all the different facets of soil health. But this is a nice short video. How is carbon stored in the soil? During photosynthesis, plants absorb CO2 and sunlight. They release oxygen and produce sugars, carbohydrates, and other long chain molecules that are mostly made up of carbon atoms. Plants release up to 40% of these carbon-rich compounds into the soil as exudates to feed fungi and bacteria. They do so in order to promote growth in the populations of these beneficial organisms, as this will eventually result in a return of nutrients to the plant. Please watch the animation on nutrient cycling for further information. Fungi produce mushrooms on occasion, but that's just a small part of the way they grow. The majority of the fungus consists of hyphae, long narrow tube-like structures that are made mostly of carbon. As a fungal hypha grows, it gets longer and branches off in different directions, looking for new food sources. Over time, its walls grow thicker and thicker, storing more and more carbon as the fungus continues to absorb exudates from the plant and also organic matter in the soil. So how can this help in the battle against climate change? Well, the biggest single organism ever discovered on planet Earth was a fungus in Oregon that measured approximately the size of 1,665 football fields and is somewhere between 2,000 and 8,000 years old. That's a lot of carbon being stored up for long periods of time. So you can think of this as a kind of carbon pump. Atmospheric carbon is absorbed by plants and pumped into the soil, where it is stored for hundreds of years by fungal hyphae. This process is known as soil carbon sequestration. How effective could soil carbon sequestration be in the struggle against climate change? Well, estimates vary, but here are some reasonably conservative numbers. Atmospheric carbon levels are currently just over 410 parts per million. That's totally off the charts when you look back over the last 450,000 years, as climate scientists have been able to do using ice core samples. This number has not been above 300 parts per million in that time. The red line on the graph is temperature change. As you can see, there has been a clear correlation between temperature change and atmospheric CO2 over the last 450,000 years. If the temperature continues to rise in accordance with current CO2 levels, then we're going to see some dramatic changes to our habitat. Just to put that in perspective, humans have only been on the planet for around 200,000 years, so we have never seen conditions like those currently being modeled by climate scientists. What is considered a safe level of atmospheric carbon? According to the United Nations IPCC, this is somewhere around 350 parts per million. That's around 60 ppm that need to be removed from the atmosphere, which equates to approximately 450 billion tons of CO2 equivalents. We're going to need this number in just a minute, so let's put it over in the corner here. How much of this can be sequestered into the soil? The answer is, we don't know. What we do know, however, is that it is possible to sequester in excess of 10 tons per hectare per year and possibly as much as 20 tons per hectare per year, as demonstrated by Dr. David Johnson at New Mexico State University, who has been successfully restoring the soil food web. Yes, this is cutting-edge research, but with more investment, this could possibly become achievable worldwide quite quickly. Humans manage approximately 5 billion hectares worldwide, so based on 20 tons per hectare per year, that equates to 100 billion tons per year. Total greenhouse gas emissions for the entire planet in 2019 were around 37 billion tons. About 50% of emissions get absorbed by natural processes, according to research by NOAA, leaving around 20 billion tons in the atmosphere. So if we did nothing else but regenerated the world's soils, we could potentially sequester about 80 billion tons per year. 450 billion tons divided by 80 billion tons per year means that we could theoretically get back to 350 parts per million, the safe level, within six years, just by regenerating the world's soils. Of course, we cannot do that overnight. Allowing time for global implementation, 10 to 15 years is a more realistic time frame. 
If you factor in reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, the picture begins to look far more optimistic. The bottom line is that this could be a big piece of the puzzle when it comes to fighting climate change. For more information about the numerous benefits of the soil food web and how you can get involved, visit Soil Food So, in the last video I was using numbers I think were a little bit aged. This was put out in 2019, I'm not sure. The 40 uh, gigaton number I was using yesterday, and usually I'm always rounding it up, it was always in the high 30s um, in most of my research. But this one's saying 45, or 450 billion tons, that's gigatons people, that's 45 gigatons. But you saw the math. That's true, right? Mathematically, that's true. Human function-wise, and getting humans to change practices though, that's proving to be a whole, whole lot slower. How many of you guys even knew that our agricultural practices were contributing to the problems this much? And that's just, you know, the way we've depleted the soil carbon sink, right? We're preventing the soil carbon sink, the one that's supposed to sequester carbon for us, from doing its job. And we're doing that and producing a whole lot more emissions at the same time that are necessary because most of those inputs that we place on the soil that's degrading its ability to one, produce good food, two, sequester carbon are all made out of fossil fuels. Plus there's a distribution of them, right? And the energy it takes to convert them. So, the synergy in just ending our horrible practices when it comes to land management tells you, yeah, there's a good chance you can knock this out in a decade. But it's going to take policy. It's going to take change in law. It's going to take a change in culture. Right? More people have to understand it from this side. And that's my problem with the climate alarmists. They keep screaming about emissions. And I hear you. Emissions are bad. CO2 is bad in the atmosphere. It's not the right place for it. It's not what our species evolved to deal with, right? The planet will get by just fine without us if the alarmists are right and it leads to a mass extinction event. We'll be part of that extinction. Life will continue in some form thereafter, just not with humans, you know. Um, but at the same time, I don't think you can institute policies that kill humans, right? And limit human potential. That says, look, 7.2 billion people is too many. We won't be able to feed them. We won't be able to clothe them. We won't be able to heat their homes. And we certainly won't be able to provide the energy necessary to grow the food needed. So, you know, a few billion are going to have to die. Who wants to make that choice? But in a lot of ways, those who don't like the Paris Accords, that's their problem with it. When you run the wickets on those policies, that's the end result. It ends a significant proportion of the human population, which some people might want to celebrate. Yay, well, that's a problem. That's not the problem, folks. It's human behavior, right? It's not the number of humans. It's the behavior of humans. Right now, we can feed 10, with the food produced this year, calorie-wise, we could have fed 10 billion people, right? Which is 3 billion more than we got. However, on that same land that we produced that 10 billion worth of food, 10 billion people's worth of food, you could probably produce 14 or 15 billion people's worth of food on that same land and sequester all that carbon that we just saw in this video. But we gotta change, right? So the world needs saving. Niagara Falls can be the voice. That's the point I'm trying to get to. Someone has to start educating the rest of the planet. Someone has to, in a, you know, in one geographic area on a very large scale basis scale this up so it's not a farm in this county and a farm in that county and a farm in this shire and a farm in that shire and a farm in this village in Africa and a farm in that village in South America, right? But to demonstrate maybe even an entire county, 
and you know that's talking about the agricultural land right and that's the potential in the agricultural land but that's not the only land right our urban environment is a very small percentage of land at the end of the day but it's still significant and there's still a lot of potential to change practices there right and as you're going to see in other videos and uh, this is probably going long so i'm going to save more of a lane for the next um, part of Hawking Niagara, where we're going to get more into the nitty gritty science, right? I'm trying not to overwhelm you with uh, chemistry and biology and a bunch of scientific terminology, but we do got to build up to it. We do have to build up to it. We do have to understand it. Um, it needs to be part of our culture if we're going to save the world. We can do it. We've done it before here in Niagara Falls. I'm asking that we uh, seriously consider doing it again. It won't be hard. And it will create more resiliency in our society. So, like I said, it's getting long. I hope this inspires you. There's a lot more out there. Go look up Dr. Lamb's tons of papers that she's written and published. Um, lots of videos. She's given lots of webinars just like um, Gabe has. Of course, she... You know, different videos, she takes you deeper and deeper into the science, science side. If, if you're starving for more, if this really piques your interest, look her up. And that's going to lead you to other people. In this video, they mentioned uh, Dr. Johnson, you know, who did the sequestration stuff. You know, another great person to go look up and see what else this guy's discovered, what else he's doing, and the ramifications, the implications of that. You know, there's Dr. Christina Jones out of Australia. Another phenomenal scientist. They're all over the planet. And I'm going to slowly, slowly introduce more and more of this. And I'm going to tie it all the way back to birding. I'm going to tie it all the way back to ecotourism. I'm going to tie it all the way back to Niagara Falls and our own brownfields and how we restore those. And how, in the restoration of those, not only do we improve our own environment and our own healthier Niagara Falls. But we can monetize it, right? And some of our other issues that we already have as a local culture that has nothing to do with the tourists, all right, that are challenging us, there's answers to these problems in this science that we can change. And in so changing, save ourselves money, improve our own health, and monetize it to demonstrate it to our tourists, right? And then send them back to their own homes to repeat the process, and that's how we get to that 10 to 15 years. Because if no one does this, and we keep ignoring this side of the science, and we keep ignoring the sequestration side, and we keep pouring billions of dollars into huge, very unpromising research threads, like building huge machines that just try to filter the carbon out of the atmosphere. And if you listen to those scientists talk about the challenge of doing it that way, even though they're totally invested in it, that's their job, and they really think they're going to accomplishment, you know, but their, their most optimistic estimate of them delivering some prototype that's functional and actually has a, you know, it takes less energy to do what they're doing and burns less fossil fuel, because right now, you know, they need electricity to run all these gadgets. And they don't have it developed to a point where, you know, I mean, basically it's going to take more energy to run these machines to get the carbon out of the atmosphere, which suggests that we'll burn more carbon and put more carbon in the atmosphere than they're going to get out at the moment. They think 10, 15, 20 years from now, they might have made it efficient enough that it does decrease the carbon. And then you've got to deploy all this technology at that point, right? And it takes up huge amounts of land to deploy these things, um, if you could do that. And there's so many other research stuff. We're spending billions and billions of dollars on that. And the answer is right there. Improve our diet by improving our land management, improving carbon sequestration, get it out of the oil. What does it cost us? If it's wrong, if they're totally wrong, if they just, you know, miss some very, important thing that they don't realize, which humans have been known to do, that's how we got on this 
horrible agricultural model that we currently have, we missed a few things, like how important the biology is in the soil and how unnecessary it is, if you get that biology right, to do these other things that we're doing. So it is possible we've missed something, right? But it still doesn't cost anything, and we know it ends up with a higher quality food and lower health care cost for us, at a minimum, making you more resilient to all the other things that climate change could possibly bring you. But if it is the answer, holy shit, you know, easy fix. So I hope this is inspiring. In the next episode, we're going to spend quite a bit more time on, on the birds because we're going to be moving into the red tail, which is prolific around here. I see them all the time. So many photos, great photos. So stay inspired, Niagara, and we'll catch you later.